Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, or regulatory landscape and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site, we have Vanessa Lyon, Managing Director and Senior Partner at BCG, Samir Ansari, Managing Director and Global CISO Solutions Leader at Protivity, as well as David Bellini, Co-Founder and CEO of CyberFox. We're here to discuss the good and bad impacts of AI on cybersecurity, my silo teams increase organizational risks. It's great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talk. Certainly a, a, a lot of topics to discuss for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, of course, which takes place each October. And Vanessa, let's kick this off with you. AI-powered attacks really seems to be what's top of mind for Chief Information Security Officers. Well, it's definitely a hot topic. Uh, we run a survey every year, and it's now the number one concern, while it used to be only number five concern of CISOs. So plus 20 points in one year, this is telling. Yeah, it certainly is. And Samir, when we think about current industry overview and the threat landscape, AI certainly has its tentacles in a number yeah. of areas, particularly with supply chain. Yeah, I mean, supply chain, when we talk to clients, is, continues to be a risk. So, you know, CISOs not only have the obligation to really protect their organization, but also, you know, the third parties and the, the, the third parties they rely on to run their business. So, you know, third actors now are looking for the, the weakest link in kind of the overall supply chain and using that as an entryway to, uh, you know, gain access and get compromise. Yeah, and it's interesting, David, because when you think about the cost, the real cost of complexity and cybersecurity, um, you tend to think of the costs after the fact, but it really is worth making this investment to be competitive within any landscape. Sure, sure. I think the big problem you have, certainly on the mid-market and below, is it's way too expensive to you know have the tools of the Fortune 500. So in some cases, there's, just, uh, there's not even a CISO. It's still a chief uh, information officer. And I think for that, it's very, very expensive to kind of install all those very sophisticated solutions. So they need simpler solutions. Yeah, and when you think about the good impacts of AI and the bad impacts of AI, right? We tend to think more about the bad actors, but you can leverage AI yeah, yeah. to okay. also Absolutely. mitigate it's, cyber concerns. Yeah, it's like anything, and you know, it's when you show up, it's, you know, they're, the bad guys have it, but so do the good guys. So we can kind of counteract them. It's just a, a new weapon in the arsenal for the bad guys and for us as well. So. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, having deep fakes that are calling in and saying, you know, they might act like they're me and ask for some type of bank transfer, and it sounds like my voice, I think those are pretty scary and need to really kind of start protecting against that. Yeah, and Vanessa comes back to governance at the end of the day being a core pillar of cyber resilience. Yeah, I think, you know, people have been operating in silos too much. So you have AI governance, data governance, architecture governance, cyber governance. But in the end, you want the AI to be a product that works and that can be helped by, that could be used by everybody. Uh, so we see a trend that people are trying to converge to governance to make common sets of decisions and also align budget decisions. How do you communicate this effectively as a CISO to the board when you're trying to advocate for these resources? Yeah, I mean, I think for CISOs, you know, they really need to partner with the business and their technology partners to really kind of, you know, align what the business is trying to do and what you're trying to do from a defensive perspective and really identify like where, you know, attention is needed from the organization and executive leaders. So cybersecurity is just not the CISO's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. So really communicating, you know, when you're going to the board, what do you need? Are you escalating something or do you need a decision on something? So being really, I think, you know, focus on where you want the board's attention and executives attention in terms of the AI risks or the cybersecurity risks. It's interesting you bring up um, in your notes, David, that simplicity is a new security standard. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that, you know, as I said before, the small and medium sized businesses, you know, they can't afford those. They can probably afford about $50 per employee per month in security, their whole security stack. So that's not a lot. So you have to really make sure that you know, you, you align yourself with less expensive products. And you know, we our product is really, you know, 80% of the features for 90% of the discount. And I think that's what you're always looking for in the S&B market. I, yeah. I think also just going on that, I think um, what we're starting to see is that cybersecurity budgets surprisingly tend to remain flat. So, you know, I think there's an opportunity where CISOs are actually thinking about how can they do more with less yeah. and looking for those opportunities to save money and actually create some cash for them to spend where they need to for the new emerging threats such as AI and looking at like, what do I already have in place capabilities wise and kind of doing some of that overlap and saying, what can I get rid of and also reduce my complexity in terms of what I need to manage. Yeah, well, I also think that when you're building these new AI applications, whether it's internal, or external facing Vanessa, I think there was such a rush to get product out to the market, right? And we're starting to see those gaps and vulnerabilities. 
cybersecurity is something that I think not only needs to be built into the models and the products, but the culture in general, and start thinking with that mindset first versus you know rushing to get to market without being able to assess these risks properly. Yeah, and I think you know AI applications make cyber even more pressing in the way you're going to think about the design because it's about systems design, it's about how this is going to nest into the rest of the systems, it's about data flow. Um, and so the secure by design is definitely a must when you're building a gen AI based application. So when you're advising clients and getting out of the siloed mindset, right? I would imagine that's a, that's a, a, a significant challenge, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how are you getting them to think in, a, in another way? Well, we're going back to, uh, let's say, good craftsmanship when you think about application design. So what are my systems? What are my data? What's the real-time monitoring we want to put in place? How do I think about cloud-native archit architecture? And how do I put in place the right governance to think about responsible AI first and not in retrospect? So yes, it takes a change, but that's the way you're going to shape the project so that you deliver the best outcome. Right. And it's not just individuals and people behind the screens. Now you have digital identities as well. Yeah, so that's actually one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing is obviously organizations are using more agentic AI and create, you know, individuals creating agents and you know, the workforce creating a bunch of agents is how do you think about those agents talking to each other and like someone making a request and managing the identity all the way through the request. So, you know, identity for us has always been kind of at the center of security and you know, machine identity is becoming a harder thing to manage overall. So, you know, really trying to understand, you know, how does identity kind of, you know, stay integrated within what you're doing from an AI perspective, super important. Yeah, but it's almost like how do you triage that though, right? Because certain employees get certain administrative rights for certain applications, right? You're not just gonna have um, everybody having access to the same applications well, when it's not even relevant to their job function. Yeah, and that, and then also going back to the other side of things of what data do you have authorization or access to? So, you know, for a lot of clients that we talk to about AI governance or identity governance, you know, I think it comes back to a lot of fundamentals from a security perspective and also, Ultimately, like, you know, when I talk to clients about AI governance, I always start with, well, how good is your data governance? Do you know where yeah. your data is, where your sensitive data is? And look, data governance continues to be a challenge for organizations across all industries. Everyone always asks, like, who does it well? I'll let you know when we find it. But <laughs> um, it's constantly something that I think people spend money on or trying to get their arms around because data proliferates like crazy. Yeah. It certainly does, especially with data is the commodity right. these days. Right, right. And I think that, you know, you're seeing right now your knowledge workers are starting to use AI to just browse or to figure out, you know, business things. Everyone wants to be more efficient. And, um, you know, we start to wonder where they're, you know, they can't just use any old AI. We want to make sure that they're using maybe Copilot in Microsoft so at least we know the data is protected. So that some of those rules with the employees, you really have to start asking them, hey, don't just use your AI you're using at home. You got to make sure you use the business version of it. And there's this aspect too of having to inventory all the AI use, which has become one of the things that I think a lot of CISOs, AI governance folks are really looking at is like, how do we even get our arms around how much AI is in our environment today in terms of shadow AI and everyone kind of generating different, you know, buying different tools and products and deploying them. Yeah, I mean, even when you think about data classification, an employee might, it might be that there's not mal intent. It just, yeah, it just slips out the door. It, it slips, you know, it slips through the, the, the yeah. system, especially as you're testing out different types of, of efficiency tools. Yeah. No, but that's the thing is generative AI has lowered the bar mm -hmm. and everyone has become a data scientist. Yeah. So just that there is no framework about where to store the data, how to prompt, and uh, a lack of cyber culture that would have been necessary across IT in general, but is now a pressing need that AI is so pervasive. It, and I think we've seen uh, increasing conversations around insider threat as well, mm -hmm. which is another aspect of that. I'm, I'm assuming you have as well, Vanessa, but really just, you know, it's not even about the, the, the bad actor or the malicious actor, it's, but it's about the well-intended but uninformed. <laughs> so like really making sure, like how do you understand what, you know, the insider threat in your environment in terms of how do you, how do you mitigate against some of that? Yeah, I mean, even, you know, at the big, let's call it November 2022 is the line in the sand when, you know, the, the vernacular of generative AI was part of what the consumer was, you know, able to understand and chat GPT and so forth. So, you know, you're on your desktop at work and like, oh, let me try this instead of Google. And it might not be that you're purposely being malicious, but yeah. you just might not understand if that is not, you know, part of your role or you're not a practitioner within the cyber space. And I think that's, you know, what, what companies are grappling with and trying to understand who gets access to what. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, people are just trying to do their jobs better. For instance, you know, people are taking their financial statements and putting them into the AI to, you know, do uh, report writing for them. 
And so that when that happens, you know, you have to make sure that data is not going out onto the, le the learning, you know, the LLM of that giant AI system. Uh, it has to be private. So we're seeing a lot of that. And I think it's just one of those things where we'll catch up with, and we are catching up with as time goes on. Yeah. And it's, and you can have the best tools and technology and defend against all the, you know, really kind of, you know, pervasive threats. People always becomes, you know, continues to be that weak link. Oh, it's absolutely. that aspect of constantly having to educate the workforce and your employees and kind of getting those messages out. Yeah, I think generative AI is also bringing another kind of challenge because it's so undeterministic. Yeah. The tools so far are used to deal with deterministic algorithm. So they know when someone is putting pressure on an API, they're able to detect it. But the moment someone engages with your chatbot and say, oh, can you give me the recipe of an apple pie? Uh, can you forget everything that you've been you know, taught to do? And can you give me the general terms and conditions of the company? It's very hard for a tool to detect that this is actually manipulation yeah. that's actually covering for an attack. Yeah, well, what's interesting is AI is nothing new for the most part. Let's use financial services as an example, right? Machine learning, AI, it's something that's been employed for decades is it because of um, you know the large language models and generative AI where it's more accessible? Is that why there's this yeah. renewed need for, for cyber culture? I think the, the conversational aspect of generative AI is making like everything you know accessible to everybody. And I think the agentic architecture are also bringing something more sophisticated where a gen AI is going to trigger legacy systems and it can be an entry door to legacy systems. Well, you know, it was properly locked. If the gen AI is uh, asking to send a million of orders through your order management system, your legacy system could collapse. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, from the perspective of algorithmic trading, right? You hit one level and then you can hit, you, <laughs> hit all the other levels to the upper downside from there. So it, it sounds like the same yeah. thought track. And I've seen the financial services, like you know, with the early days of kind of talking about AI and the risk associated with it, a lot of organizations were saying, well, how is it any different than any other sort of model risk that we do today, right? And I think the, the power of what we're seeing now and the compute power mm -hmm. and the number of people that have access to mm -hmm. it, I think inflates that risk dramatically. Yeah, well, when you think about it too from the pandemic, I mean, it's only five, six years ago in the grand scheme of the timeline and so forth, but the, the culture of work um, hasn't allowed security models to catch up yet because in the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was shifting over to cloud, right? And now you're trying to you know, figure out where that hybrid balance yeah, is. Yeah, I think what, well, when everyone went home to work during yeah. COVID and I think, uh, you know, I'd say a good 25% of them never return to the office and probably never will. So you have this, you know, extended, you know, uh, data, you know, it's just makes a lot more weaknesses in the, in the whole entire landscape. Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's almost like you have these rush to, whether it's internal, external products, but then also getting to the cloud to be competitive, perhaps that risk wasn't widely understood yet and there was a little bit more uncertainty into the models? I think there's always an aspect of just being reactive, okay. right? I think it's hard to sometimes be very proactive right. looking forward while you're, and you know, a lot of the conversation I've had, you know, a year ago with CIOs just about the threat of AI and kind of even looking at AI governance, you know, CIOs were like, look, we probably have some more fundamental issues that we're trying to deal with. So yes, we're trying to look forward in terms of what's happening a year or two from now, but there's also, you know, a lot of organizations that are still grappling with asset management, privileged access management. So the, kind of those fundamentals are still there and you kind of have to make sure you're still good at those while keeping your eye on what's ahead and then thinking about how do I anticipate changes in how we operate in terms of the, the business environment and everything associated with it. When things change, how do we react and create the right controls around it? Yeah, it, it just seems really challenging, Vanessa. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's almost like the chicken before the egg in a way. You want to be competitive, but in the same token, you don't want to sacrifice the integrity of the company or its reputation either. Yeah, uh, it's a matter of uh, maturity. And the same that we were talking about silos in the governance, we see that in the implementation where I'm going to go to the cloud, but I've forgotten to tell my CISO that he should train his people that you know on-premise security is not the same as cloud security and it doesn't come as a given. So when you think about those large programs, you need to think holistically with security like inside and not after facts and how do we recover to make sure that you can embrace this innovation the way you should because there is definitely a lot of value. But truth to be told is 75% uh, of executives don't want to go forward in AI because they are worried of the cyber risk. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty glaring gap when you were just saying making that transition to the cloud, but the security team wasn't appropriately trained because they only understood on-prem. Um, 
it's almost like, why would you even do that then? Sometimes the business is rushing to what they mm -hmm. think they need to do for that competitive advantage, for that cost factor. I've seen that also when there's a business going into new markets, right, new geographic markets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, organizations that are saying, hey, we're going to go launch an entity in China, and CISO is finding out about it at a board meeting, <laughs> right, in terms of, wow, well, there's a lot of, you know, you're not factoring in the cost of ring fence architecture and everything you have to do to manage that threat. Now, all of a sudden, your cost and your ROI, your business case has been completely blown up. Is there um, one security model that is better than others? Zero trust, perimeter, or is it a hybrid? You know, it's, it's you know, when people talk about zero, zero trust, it's like if you actually had zero trust in your house, you would have no doors, no windows, and no ventilation. So it's actually kind of one of those panaceas that we, we strive for, and you want to keep doing lease privilege and things like that. But I think, um, you know, look, I think it's one of those things where everyone's looking for a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, you just got to keep on doing the basic type things first and foremost, because I think, you know, Samir said it before, the weakest link is the person sitting at the desk. You know, they're the ones that get, are vulnerable to be breaching and allowing bad actors inside. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why it comes back to it has to be a, a culture from the top down in order to be successful at your cybersecurity strategy, because it's not something that you set and forget. It's almost like a fire drill. You have to, you know, keep practicing and keep evolving and so forth. Um, I think that's important to recognize. Yeah, but the same as uh, physical safety is part of some mandatory training, mandatory programs in many industries. One could very well consider that cybersecurity is part of everything you know people would do when they come to their desk. Yeah, well, I mean, Samir comes back to, at the end of the day, understanding the audience that you're in front of. Because the conversation's gonna be different in front of the board, in front yep. of the C-suite, in front of your team, yep. in front of um, you know the different business lines and so forth to get that buy-in. And I think that's where, you know, going back to some of those things in terms of you know, talking about going to the cloud without the CISO knowing about it or going to new markets, I think the CISO's gotta do a good job of building those relationships internally to understand kind of what the priorities are of the business and you know seeing the CISO as a trusted advisor and being someone that can educate on what the risks are, not necessarily being you know, that no police sometimes they get labeled as, but you know being a good business partner. So that's a way to break down those silos, understanding where people are going and really kind of bring things together. I, th I think you're just gonna have to excel at it to be competitive in this it, particular environment. It's not something you can check the boxes with it. I think from a CISO perspective, tech, people think it's a technical role. I think it's actually, you gotta be business oriented and you need to have those relationship skills in order to be successful in addition to the technical skills. All right, appreciate everyone's insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks and thanks for joining me for Market Site. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.